Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 1. In the last video, I ended by telling you about a unit called the mole. It's one of the most useful ideas in chemistry, and today we'll start using it to perform some simple but important calculations. Along the way, we'll learn about the work of some of the most creative scientists of the 20th century, including everybody's favorite, Albert Einstein. But first, back to moles. In the last video, I told you about Avogadro's number, and that Avogadro's number can have two different units, AMUs per gram and molecules per mole. That means that we can use Avogadro's number to convert between AMUs and grams, or between molecules and moles. Before we do that, I want to say a little bit about Avogadro's number itself. It's named for Amadeo Avogadro, who came up with the idea in 1811 in Turin, Italy. Avogadro got his training in ecclesiastical law, but he practiced as a lawyer only briefly before he got really interested in physics and gave up law to become a full-time scientist and teacher. He realized that in a given volume of gas at room pressure, there are always the same number of gas molecules no matter what the gas is. So, a container of hydrogen contains the same number of molecules as a container of water vapor, or propane, or chlorine at the same temperature or pressure. This was a big step forward in our understanding of the way gases work, and we'll talk more about it in a future video. For now, the important thing to realize is that although Avogadro realized that a container of gas always contains the same number of molecules, it was impossible back then to know what the number was, Molecules are just too small and light to measure using the technology of 1811. It wasn't until much later that scientists could measure what the number actually is. In 1895, the French physicist Jean-Baptiste Perrin calculated the number of molecules in one mole of a substance and found out that it was 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. It was Perrin who decided to name this Avogadro's number in honor of the man who first came up with the idea. Perrin's calculation of Avogadro's number was confirmed several years later by none other than Albert Einstein. We'll be hearing about some of Einstein's other contributions to chemistry later in the course. It turns out that he and Perrin worked on many of the same puzzles in science, and it was Perrin who used Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared to suggest that stars might be able to shine for billions of years if they used nuclear fusion reactions. This was a very important discovery in astrophysics. So, what makes moles so important? Well, as I mentioned, Avogadro's number is the conversion factor between AMUs and grams. So take salt, sodium chloride, for example. Using masses from the periodic table, we can calculate the mass of a sodium chloride molecule. Don't forget, when we add the masses of sodium and chlorine, we should round our total mass so that it has the correct number of significant figures. If you've forgotten how to do that, you should refresh your memory by reviewing the previous video. So, the mass of an NaCl molecule is 58.4425 AMU. But remember, Avogadro's number allows us to convert between AMUs and grams. That means that if we had 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of NaCl, it would weigh 58.4425 grams. Avogadro's number of something is called a mole. So one mole of NaCl weighs 58.4425 grams. So we can give the mass of NaCl as 58.4425 AMUs per molecule or 58.4425 grams per mole. Both of these are correct, and they're each useful in different situations. For example, Suppose I wanted to know the mass of one NaCl molecule in grams. We know that one molecule weighs 58.4425 AMU. To convert that to grams, we use Avogadro's number. Whenever we want to convert from one unit to another, the easiest way is to multiply our number by a fraction. 
the two sides of the fraction contain the two parts of the conversion factor. For example, our conversion factor says that one gram contains Avogadro's number of AMUs. So those are the two numbers that we'll put in the fraction. But which number goes in the numerator and which in the denominator? That's an important thing to keep straight. People make mistakes by switching the two parts of the fraction more often than almost any other mistake in a general chemistry course, and doing it the wrong way will almost always give you a very different answer. To make sure you always do it the right way, just remember something you learned a long time ago in math class when you first learned about fractions. Suppose you were multiplying these two fractions. You can make it easier by canceling out the 4 in the numerator of the first fraction and in the denominator of the second one. Now you can just multiply what's left in the two fractions to get your answer. The same is true in the calculation we want to do. We're trying to find the mass in grams, so we only want grams in our answer. We want the AMUs to cancel out. Since AMU is in the numerator of our first number, we need it to be in the denominator of the conversion factor so that it'll cancel out. So, 1 gram goes up on top, and 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd AMU goes on the bottom. The AMUs cancel, and we get our answer. 9.704832 times 10 to the minus 23rd grams. This calculation also shows us something new about significant figures. When we added numbers, we said that the answer should have the same number of decimal places as the least precise number that we added. The least precise number, in this case, has four decimal places, so that's how many our answer has. But the rule is a little different when we multiply or divide numbers. What matters in that case is not how many decimal places it has. Instead, we care about the overall number of significant figures the numbers we started with had. In this case, this number had six figures total, and the second number had four figures. So our answer will need to have the same number of figures as the number we started with that had the fewest. In this case, our answer would have four significant figures. So the answer is 9.705 times 10 to the minus 23rd grams. You might be wondering why there are four significant figures instead of just one. After all, the numerator of this fraction just has the number one. The reason is that the numerator here is exactly one gram. In other words, it's one 0. 0.00000 and so on. It doesn't have just one significant figure, it has an infinite number of zeros after the decimal point. We don't write it that way, because it's a pain to write dozens of zeros in a situation like this. But a general rule of thumb is, whenever you're multiplying or dividing something by an integer, you can assume the integer has an infinite number of zeros after the decimal, so you can ignore the integer when you're deciding how many significant figures to put in your answer. Now let's try another problem. Suppose we have a grain of salt weighing 0 0.00161 grams. How many moles is that? To answer that question, we need another conversion factor. Remember, we saw earlier that NaCl weighs 58.4425 grams per mole. So our conversion factor will be a fraction with 55.425 grams on one side and one mole on the other side. The important thing to get right is which number goes in the numerator and which goes in the denominator. Remember, we want our answer to be in moles, so we want grams to cancel out. Since grams is in the numerator in the first number, we want it to be in the denominator of our fraction. That means our answer is 2.754 8445 times 10 to the minus 5 moles. Now we need to round it to the correct number of significant figures, or sig figs for short. You can see that this number has 6 sig figs, but what about this one? 
This brings us to another important rule. If your number starts with any zeros, the zeros at the beginning aren't significant. That means all these zeros don't count, and the number has just three sig figs. So that's how many our answer should have. That rule might seem strange to you. Why don't the beginning zeros count? The rule makes more sense if you write the number in scientific notation. If you do, this number is 1.61 times 10 to the minus 3. You can see that that number definitely has three sig figs. When you write a number in scientific notation, all the zeros at the beginning disappear. That's why they don't count. Now for another calculation. This time, let's figure out how many molecules are in the NaCl sample that we had in our last problem. Remember, we had 2.75 times 10 to the minus 6 moles. The conversion factor we need between moles and molecules is Avogadro's number. There is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules in a mole. Once again, we have to be sure that we set up our fraction so that we cancel the units that we're trying to get rid of. In this case, that means that we need to put moles in the denominator. And our answer is 1.66 times 10 to the 19 molecules. One thing to notice about that last problem is that our answer was a huge number. We only had a single salt crystal, but even that tiny crystal has 16 quintillion, 600 quadrillion salt molecules in it. This is another example that shows just how tiny molecules are and how large Avogadro's number is. After those examples, we now know how to get a lot of information just by starting with a chemical formula and the mass or number of moles. For example, suppose we have 2.25 moles of NaCl. How many grams is that? We start with the number we're given, 2.25 moles. And now we need to convert from moles to grams. The number of grams in a mole is different for every compound, but we get it by using the masses on the periodic table. For NaCl, we already calculated that. It's 58. 0.4425 grams per mole. So our conversion factor has 58.4425 grams on one side and one mole on the other side. We want moles to cancel out, so that's what we'll put in the denominator. That gives us an answer of 131 grams. We've been working with NaCl quite a lot, so let's try a problem with a different compound. How many moles of lead 2 iodide are in 20.0 grams? This will tie together several things we've learned in the past few videos, so it's a good one to try. First, we need to figure out the formula of lead 2 iodide. The formula name tells us that the two atoms in this compound are lead and iodine. Also, the Roman numeral 2 tells us that the charge on the lead is plus 2. To get the charge on the iodine, we look at the periodic table. Based on where iodine is, we can see that it has a charge of minus 1. So, to make the charges cancel, the formula of lead 2 iodide must be PbI2. So our question is asking how many moles of PbI2 are in 20.0 grams? To find out, we need the conversion factor from grams to moles. Again, we get that by looking at the periodic table. Remember that we have two iodines, so the mass of iodine must be multiplied by two. So we find that one mole of lead 2 iodide weighs 461.0 grams, so that's our conversion factor. We want the grams to cancel out, so the grams goes in the denominator of our fraction, and our answer turns out to be 0.0 433839 moles. Don't forget to use the correct number of significant figures. Of the numbers we started with, this one had three sig figs, and this one had four, so our answer should have three sig figs. Remember, the zeros at the beginning aren't counted as significant, 
So our final answer is 0 0.0434 moles. Let's finish up by trying a harder problem. How many grams of lead are in our 20.0 grams of lead 2 iodide? This is a little harder because unlike the other problems we've done, we can't do this one all in one step. We'll need more than one conversion factor. In any problem like that, where you have more than one step to do, the thing that most people have trouble with is knowing where to start. But there's a good rule of thumb to follow. It's usually much easier to work with moles than with grams, so your first step should be to convert whatever data you're given into moles. So, we start with the number that we're given, 20.0 grams of PBI2. And our first step should be to convert that into moles. The conversion factor is the molecular weight of the lead 2 iodide, which we get from the periodic table. This is exactly the same calculation that we did just a minute ago. So if we stop here, we would have the moles of lead 2 iodide, which we already saw is 0.0434 moles. But this time, we don't want to stop there. We have more steps to do. We're trying to find out how much lead is in our sample. We can't really tell how many grams of lead there are yet, but we can tell how many moles there are. How? Just look at the formula. The subscripts tell us that every molecule of lead 2 iodide has one lead atom and two iodines in it. That means that every mole of lead 2 iodide contains one mole of lead. So that's our next conversion factor. One mole of PBI2 contains one mole of lead. Which one should go in the numerator and which in the denominator? Well, we're interested in the lead, so we want the lead 2 iodide to cancel out. So that will go in the denominator. If we were to stop the calculation now, our answer would tell us how many moles of lead there are. But what we want to know is how many grams there are. So we have one more conversion factor to do. We want to convert from moles of lead to grams of lead. So we need the periodic table again. The mass of lead is 207.2 grams per mole. We want the moles to cancel, so the one mole will go in the denominator. If you look at these fractions, you'll see that all the units will cancel out except for the grams of lead, and that's what we want to know. So we're finally ready to do our calculation. We'll multiply all the numerators together and divide by all the denominators. When we do that, we get an answer of 8.989154 grams of lead. If we now look at the numbers in our fractions, we can see that this one has three sig figs, this one has four, and this one has four. So our answer should have three, which gives us 8.99 grams. That's a good place for us to stop. You've learned how to do some important calculations, and we'll get more practice on them in class. These are among the most useful skills that you're going to learn in this course. You'll use calculations like this for the rest of the course, and in every chemistry course that you ever take. You'll even use them in your work if you become a professional chemist, so this is a skill you should really try to master. So to sum up, you've learned how to convert back and forth between grams, AMUs, the number of molecules, and the number of moles of molecules or elements within the molecules. In addition to these examples and the ones you'll see in class, there are many more examples in the textbook and in the homework problems. Problems like these are a big part of your quizzes and tests, so please come and ask me if you have any trouble. Until then, good luck and have a good week.